Welcome to an introduction to the inverse functions for cosecant, secant, and cotangent. Just as we did when we found the inverses for sine, cosine, and tangent, in order to determine the inverses of cosecant, secant, and cotangent, the domains must be restricted to make the functions one-to-one. -one. Remember, this is necessary in order to have an inverse function. And we will restrict the domains as follows. For y equals cosecant x, we'll restrict it on the closed interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And of course, x can't equal 0, because it's undefined there. y equals secant x on the closed interval from 0 to pi, x not equal to pi over 2. And for y equals cotangent x, the domain will be on the open interval from 0 to pi. So the inverse function for y equals cosecant x is given as y equals inverse cosecant of x or y equals arc cosecant x. There's two ways to represent the inverse of y equals cosecant x. Down below here I've graphed y equals cosecant x and y equals inverse cosecant x to do a comparison. Here's our restricted domain and notice that the domain of y equals cosecant x becomes the range of the inverse function and the range of the cosecant function becomes the domain of the inverse cosecant function. And that's important because you need to recognize when you have an inverse cosecant function, the x or the input of this function is actually the cosecant function value and the output or y is the angle that produces that function value. Another property that we've discussed about a function and its inverse is that it's symmetrical across the line y equals x. On this screen you can see very clearly that these two functions are symmetrical across the line y equals x. The inverse function of y equals secant x is given as y equals inverse secant x or y equals arc secant x. And again I've graphed y equals secant x here and y equals inverse secant x here. And again, the important part to remember here is that this restricted domain for y equals secant x becomes the range for the inverse function and the range of the function becomes a domain of the inverse. So when we're looking at y equals inverse secant x, x is the secant function value and y is the angle that produces that secant function value. And if we graph these two functions on the coordinate plane with y equals x, we can see they do share the symmetry across that line y equals x. And lastly, the inverse of y equals cotangent x is y equals inverse cotangent x or y equals arc cotangent x. And again, I've graphed y equals cotangent x here and y equals inverse cotangent here. Because these equations were obtained by interchanging the x and y variables, the domain and ranges have also interchanged. The domain of the function becomes the range of the inverse, and the range of the function becomes a domain of the inverse. So the input x is actually the cotangent function value, and y is the angle that produces that cotangent function value. And again, if we graph them on the coordinate plane with y equals x, we'll see their reflections across that line y equals x. Let's go ahead and take a look at some problems. I've done some preliminary work for us. In red on the left, I've listed the possible outputs for these functions. I've also listed the reference triangles down below, and this will help us find the exact angle that produces these given function values. So when we look at number one, arc secant of negative two, it'll be helpful to write this as a fraction or a ratio of negative two over one. So this is asking us to find the angle that has a cosecant function value of negative two over one. Well, Remember that cosecant is a reciprocal of sine, so this angle would also have a sine of negative one half. And that tells us that our reference angle is going to be a 30 degree angle because a 30 degree angle has a sine of one half or a cosecant of 2 over 1. Next, because the function value is negative, we're going to have to be in the fourth quadrant. 
So we're going to sketch a 30 degree reference angle in the fourth quadrant. So the angle we're looking for in this interval would be negative 30 degrees, or negative pi over 6 radians. So notice how even though we have arc cosecant, it's often helpful to look at the, the reciprocal ratio because those are the ones we're more familiar with. On number two, we have arc secant of 2 square root 3 over 3. This is pretty difficult to determine which angle would have a secant function value of this. So it might be helpful if we take a look at arc cosine instead. Since cosine is a reciprocal of secant, arc cosine would be 3 over 2 square root 3. Still not easy to recognize, but I think if we rationalize this, we might be able to recognize it in one of these reference triangles. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll take 3 divided by 2 square root 3 and rationalize it. So we'll have 3 square root 3 over 6, which does simplify nicely to square root 3 over 2. So our reference angle will be an angle that has a cosine ratio of square root 3 over 2. If you look at this triangle here, 3 degrees has a cosine ratio of square root 3 over 2. So that's our reference angle. And in this interval, we're going to be in the first quadrant. And this is the angle we're looking for. So arc secant of 2 square root 3 divided by 3 equals 30 degrees, or pi over 6 radians. Let's go ahead and take a look at one more. Number three, we have arc cotangent negative square root 3. It might be helpful to write this as negative square root 3 over 1. So we're looking for an angle that has a cotangent function value of negative square root 3 over 1. Going over to our reference triangles, we're going to look for an angle that has an adjacent over opposite ratio of square root 3 over 1. If you look at 3 degrees again, adjacent over opposite is square root 3 over 1. So that tells us our reference angle will be 30 degrees. But since the cotangent function value is negative, and here are the possible outputs, we're going to have a 30 degree reference angle in quadrant 2. So a 30 degree reference angle would actually be an angle that measures 150 degrees, which is equal to 5 pi 6 radians. While we're here, let's go ahead and check a couple of these on our graphing calculator. So for number one, since there's no arc cosecant key, we can use arc sine. So second sine, but then we have to take the reciprocal ratio, so it'll be negative 1 over 2. And this verifies our output of negative 30 degrees. For number two, instead of arc secant, we'll use arc cosine, second cosine, and then we'll take the reciprocal of this, which we'll have listed here. 3 divided by 2 square root 3. And that one looks good. On this last one, we're going to have a little bit of a problem. Let's see what happens. We're going to use arc tangent because we don't have an arc cotangent key. And if the arc cotangent is negative square root 3 over 1, we would think that the arc tangent would be negative 1 divided by square root 3. And notice we have negative 3 degrees, which does not match our answer. This does not mean that we are incorrect because remember that the output for arc tangent is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and the output for arc cotangent is between 0 and pi radians. So we can notice that we have a 30 degree reference angle from this, but it doesn't really help us evaluate this. So what this tells us, we have to be very careful when we use our calculator to evaluate some of these. This is the correct answer here, but there's no way of really verifying it on the graphing calculator because of the restrictions that we've made in the domain to come up with these inverse trig functions. Okay, I hope you found this video helpful. Thank you for watching.